I'm smoking, I've got a raging crack addiction, you know, I'm separated from my daughter, I'm in a Venezuelan prison where people are getting killed all around me, where I have to face the next 10 years of my life. Mm. Um, yeah, I took an overdose. Hi and welcome to this episode of Extraordinary Lives, the podcast from Lad Bible. We are joined here today by Natalie Welsh. Welcome, Natalie. Uh, hi, thank you, Ben. <laughs> and uh, for anyone who isn't aware of who you are, could you just give a brief introduction? Yeah, I'm um, author of the book Escape from Venezuela's Deadliest Prison, which is available on Amazon, which, as it says in the title, it's um, my biography about my time in incarceration in a jail in Venezuela where I got caught drug smuggling in the year 2001 and my subsequent um, escape from, from there. Fantastic. Um, that book title is one of those ones that you don't need to do any work, do you? It just sells it itself. It <laughs> kind of says it in the title, yeah. doesn't it? Yeah. Okay, well, I'm excited to hear all about it. Um, but in terms of you as a person, why don't we sort of go back to the beginning and sort of learn a little bit about how you ended up in that situation? So what was childhood like for you? Um, I had a pretty difficult childhood. Um, my mum and dad had, had split up um, before I was born. So my mum had a new partner. Um, so I was brought up by my stepdad. And um, he was a bully, really. And it was difficult. Um, there was a lot of physical and mental abuse involved. So naturally... I think, you know, it's that naturally leads on to rebellion and mm -hmm. um, misbehaviour and conflict. And um, I got put into a children's home, which was just so unruly. Um, it was just chaos. What age was this? I was, I think I was like 12 or 13 okay. when I got put in the children's home. And there were... About another 30 kids there, I think. So there's like 30 other children there from the ages of like 9 to 16. Oh, wow. All with whatever issues going on because that's why they're in a children's mm. home. Um, and it was just mayhem and chaos. So then, again, that just kind of leads to more um, rebellion, I think. Did you Do you remember feeling... Did you understand why you were there? Like, did you know that you'd done a series of events that meant you were there and you were like, well, I, I did it? Or was it was there a sense of sort of anger and frustration and confusion? Um, it was relief. Oh, I was okay. relieved, yeah, because um, it meant that I wasn't in the family home and it meant that I wasn't getting abused and bullied by my yeah. stepdad. Okay. So um, the police came and put me in the children's home. Right. So when I was put in there, it was just total relief um because I was always walking on eggshells at home all the time I never knew mm. what was gonna trigger um my stepdad so it was just a really volatile nervous environment to be in so to go from that into this children's home where it was just everybody was just doing what they wanted mm. there was no kind of consequences to oh. anything it was from one end of the scale to the complete opposite end of the scale there was no kind of in between on on the journey right so that you'd imagine as someone on the outside, you'd imagine the children's home was designed to give you some sort of structure or mm -hmm. something like that, but mm. was it the opposite? Complete opposite, right. yeah. Um, I think from what I can understand now, those kind of children's home that I was in, they don't exist anymore. I think they either encourage like foster home placements okay. or there's just kind of like temporary accommodation for young adults with like support workers, but the environment that I was in, I think that's definitely kind of been like eradicated now. I think they've looked back on that and seen that it, it doesn't work. Mm. And how long did you stay in there for? Until I was 16 years old. So 12 to 16. Yeah. And what was life like in there? Like how did it start to shape how your life would progress after leaving? Um, well, whilst I was in there, um, I, I had a relationship with my social worker. Oh, wow. Which okay. was, he was supposed to be in charge of, I don't know, like he was my key worker. So he's supposed to be in charge of um, guiding me into adulthood. And So how old were you at that point? 14, 15. And how old was he? Older than that. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, he so, was in his 30s. Oh, God. Yeah. So, so an illegal relationship. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 
Wow. Yeah, okay. and then I went on and had a, we've got a child together. Okay. Got my daughters from him. Yeah, so that kind of really messed my head up as well because I was yeah. I was already messed up. Yeah. Then entered into this relationship that went on for quite a while and he was married with kids and so it was just... Do you mind me asking, I don't want to, if you don't want to answer it's fine, I don't want to okay. pry, but is your relationship with him, like when you look back on that relationship, do you see it as a relationship or do you see him as a predator I see that he was in a position of power yeah. um, that he abused. Yeah. Like, um, I don't know if I'd say predator, um, but I think that he should have recognised that I was a messed up kid yeah. that had a history of unhealthy relationships with older men mm. um and he should have reacted and responded differently mm -hmm. and instead of encouraging and entertaining this um relationship mm. at the time i didn't see anything i thought that i was in love with him maybe i was in love with him or infatuated or maybe i was looking for this fatherly figure or i just wanted to feel love you know and but when I look back on it now, then I understand that on every level, um, it it shouldn't have happened. Yeah, um, um, yeah, I, I can see it's a very complex situation because you have a daughter mm -hmm. now mm. in that relationship. What mm. what age did you get pregnant? Was Sixteen. It? Sixteen. Right. Yeah. Okay. So, were pe do you think people were aware that that relationship was ongoing? Uh, he lost his job for it. Right. Okay. Yeah. yeah eventually. Okay. Wow. Okay. So what happened at that point when you got pregnant? So I think I'd, I'd left the children's home. So I left the children's home on my 16th birthday mm. Oh. and then went into my own accommodation, got pregnant at 16. Um, and I think I thought... Oh, so the pregnancy was after you'd left the yeah, children's home? Yeah, it was just after. Okay, but you continued the relationship? Yeah, okay. yeah, it was just after. And I think, you know, I thought that we were going to be together and we were going to have be happy families mm. and, you know, none of that happened. Um, and it was a struggle because I was a single parent, basically. You know, he would occasionally show up. but And I didn't get, you know, much family support at all, like hardly anything from my mum. And so, um, and I didn't really know what I was doing. And mm. um, and I thought I knew everything, you know, as you do, I think, as any 16 year old probably does. And uh, I really battled with it and uh, and it was a real struggle. I mean, I can't imagine what that was like, because I think I, my, I, my child was born when I was late thirties and I mm. found it very hard as someone mm. who had a lot of life experience. So being a 16 year old, in quite an unusual circumstance, it must have been really hard. Yeah, I mean, I think I felt, I thought I was so grown up. I think because mm. of what I'd gone through mm. from an okay. early age in yeah. life and because of living in the children's home and kind of like fending for myself and I think I just felt like I was a, a grown up and like I said, like I knew it all and really I was just a, a child inside and mm. um, I wasn't ready for for what was about to come. Okay, well, let's talk about that. What was about to come? How did it progress from moving into that flat with a, with a baby? Mm. What was the next step? So um, I was experimenting. I mean, I'd, I'd been experimenting with drugs when I think I started about 14 years old in the children's home. Mm. I started experimenting with drugs, with um, amphetamines and ecstasy. And then there was kind of like a a natural progression then um, into cocaine. And then I was living in my flat with my daughter. Mm -hmm. And I had like this group of friends, which I felt like this... Um, I felt like I was doing the things that I was supposed to be doing, finally. You know, I was 16, 17 years old, and I had these group of friends that were age age appropriate, and we were going out to, you know, bars and parties and rivers and just doing the things that you're supposed to be doing mm -hmm. at, at that age. And it was the first kind of time in my life that I'd felt that I fitted in and I was really happy. And that's um, 
all went wrong. And um, I had, I'd split it with um, my daughter's dad by this mm -hmm. point and I uh, had a boyfriend in this group of friends and we split up and because they were kind of like his friends, I felt myself, I found myself like just isolated again. Mm -hmm. um, and it was just heartbreaking for me. I really struggled to to deal with that, to suddenly go from having, you know, being in the center of something to suddenly just being like on my own. Um, I wasn't mentally prepared for it at all. And in the village that I was living in at the time, there was a huge um, presence of, track, of crack dealers. Mm. They'd come over from Jamaica mm -hmm. and set up like bases all over the place. You know, there were probably like three kind of flats that were working 24 hours a day that had people that would been, you know, coming over from Jamaica specifically to work these flats. Mm. Um, and that's just in the area that I was in. And then and there what were- What year was this? This was like, 19, hang on, 1999. Okay. Right. Yeah, it was around 1999. Um, and there was a, a, a girl in specific that kind of recruited me. I'm not, I'm not blaming her, you know, because I made my own choices mm -hmm. and I made the, de the decisions to do what I started doing. But it was heavily influenced by this girl that was coming round um, the and bringing drugs round. Like the the drug dealers were giving her drugs, and then she was coming round and feeding me these drugs like for free, um, and just got me hooked so quickly. Like literally within like a week, I think. What kind of drugs were crack they? cocaine? Right. Okay. Yeah, crack cocaine, and it just completely ruined me. Mm. Like, I was already broken anyway, and then I found like this. I don't know, community and some kind of escapism, I think, mm -hmm. in the in the drug. But it's just so fake and false and temporary. But it was too late. I was just completely consumed by it. And at that point, I guess the job had been done in terms of giving you free drugs because now you wanted drugs that you had to yeah. pay for in yeah. some way. Yeah, well, as soon as I got, I remember, I remember it so clearly. Um, I was on benefits at the time and I remember... The, I was being given these drugs all the time and I said, oh, when I get my benefits, you know, I'll, I'll sort you out. Mm. And I got my benefits and I spent it all like instantly within a couple of hours of getting it. I'd spent it all on crack and I had no food, no gas, no electric. Um, and that's how my life then continued for the next three years, you know, and trying to kid myself every time. Well, you know, that was silly. I shouldn't have done that. Um hating on myself, really chastising myself and hating on myself, but then doing exactly the same thing. And are you raising a child at this point? Too? Trying to. Trying yeah, to. not very well. But did you yeah. have any support for that with the, the, the father's side or anything? Not like from that? the father, no. no. Um, I was really lucky that I had support from a, from a friend right. who she recognised what was going on. So from there... Um, I started committing crime, mm -hmm. uh, which is just, again, a natural progression of, of being a drug addict. Um, and then I got offered an opportunity or got asked if I wanted to to go away and, and smuggle some drugs. And was that by the people you were buying it from? Yeah. So were they doing it as a kind of, instead of paying, you can do this and we'll give you some? Or well, no, they, they offered to pay me. like a, a, Oh, I see. Yeah, they right. said, you want to go to you know, this place, you want to go and get some drugs and, you know, we'll pay you this amount of money. And what attracted to it, me to it, more than anything, it wasn't the money, it was getting away from the environment that I was in. Mm -hmm. Like my brain, like, was so messed up. I thought that it would be an opportunity to get to get clean. Mm -hmm. Even though I'm going to go and get a suitcase mm -hmm. full of the very poison that's killing me, I thought, well, I can go there and I can get away from this place all I need to do is is get away from from here and break these like habits and this mm -hmm. cycle and get away from these people so I thought I can I can go there I can go and do that trip I can get clean and then I can come back with the drugs and I'll be clean and I'll have money and I just won't do it when I come back okay and, you know that was the 
I think that's how I justified it to myself in in my head. But can you talk us through that first trip then, the the first experience of transporting drugs? Yeah. Well, the first time, um, it didn't go to plan. So I went to Jamaica, and then um, when I got there, I was quite. I was really lonely actually because mm. I'd gone from. I was just in a country where you know I didn't mm. know anybody. I was kind of left on my own but it was an opportunity to you know I was not smoking drugs so I kind of I think I kidded myself into thinking you know when I get back that's it you know I thought I was clean um but while I, whilst I was there um the person that I was working for told me not to bring anything back oh. because they'd been told somebody knew that I'd gone there and they'd been told that the police were going to be waiting for me, like expecting me um, at the airport or when I got back. So I didn't actually bring anything back the the first time. So I got a free trip though. And did they still pay you? No. Right. And were they angry at you? Or? Yeah, yeah, they were really angry with me. Oh, but what, yeah. what, what had you done wrong? I'd said some, I told somebody that I was going. Okay. And that person had then like told a rival gang. Okay. Then it was the rival gang then that had been in contact and said... And were the know, police waiting when you got back? Yeah, yeah. I got oh, they torn, were? Yeah, I got torn apart at the airport. Oh, wow. Yeah. So if you had brought something back, yeah. it would have been... Yeah, so they would have totally got me. Right, okay. Yeah. yeah. Wow. You would have thought that should have been enough to put me off, yes. really. <laughs> but, <laughs> okay. you know... And, yeah. and and how, how much would they pay you for a trip? Like, what was the offer to do that? £4,000. Wow, which 90s probably seemed like a lot of money. In the position that I was in, it seemed like a lot of money. Yeah. Relevant to what I was doing, yes. the risk yeah. I'm taking, and relevant to how much money, money they're making, um, it's peanuts. But okay. I didn't understand any of that. Four thousand pounds just like, was a lot sounded like a lot of money to me. So the first one had gone wrong. Yeah. They were annoyed at you. Obviously yeah. you'd had a bit of a shock. Yeah. Um a lot of people I think would have gone, got off lucky there, let's stop. Mm. But you continued with the same yeah. gang? No, I did it with a different gang okay. this time. Okay. So the first one went wrong and then there was a couple of success a few successful ones. Yeah. And then the one that we're going to get to is the one that went catastrophically wrong. Yeah. <laughs> um, so how did that come about, the Venezuela trip? So I'd done the the successful ones mm. to Holland. Um, and then every time I'd been doing these trips, I'd been connected. There was like a, a small team of people that were kind of in charge of like looking after me, mm. you know, so they'd pick me up from the train station and I'd stay with them, like kind of minders mm -hmm. really. Um, and two of them who I'd met like a few times now, they did this regularly or so, well, they said that they'd done this regularly and they were smugglers and I'd stay at their houses in, you know, in London and it was really nice houses with really nice furniture and they were dressed really well and they had really nice clothes and I wanted that life. Mm. Um, I don't know if that was part of their role was to, you know, enamour me mm. with the with the lifestyle. Again, I wasn't thinking about consequences. I wasn't thinking about the damage that the drugs, even mm. though I, you know, obviously I knew firsthand because I was a, a victim myself, but I, I wasn't thinking of anybody else. I was just thinking, of, you know, it was really selfish um, thought process that I was going through. And I saw this life that these other smugglers had. And I thought, I, you know, I want some of that. Mm. You know, I'm fed up of my shitty life, which I've had most of my life. I, I want a good life. I want some money and I want a nice house. Mm -hmm. I want to be drug free. And at the time... Were they drug free? Yeah. They weren't users? No, right. no not at okay. all. And at the time, f for me, that was that was kind of my, my, my ticket, you mm. know, a w that I was looking for. Okay, so they set up this trip to Venezuela for you. Yeah. Um, what drug was it that you were... Cocaine. Cocaine. And was yeah. it, you, were, you were taking it or you were going to collect it and bring it back? I was collecting it and bringing it and back. And bringing it back. Yeah. And am I right in thinking that on this trip, I mean, maybe this is what you did before, but this trip was different because you took your daughter, didn't you? Yeah. 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 So where did that decision come into it? Um, I was I was told to. She'd come with me on the on my other trip. Oh, okay. She had been right. she had been with me. 
Um, and by now I'm building up my confidence as well. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the Jamaican thing they told me, they said, don't bring anything back. Mm. So I think I was always thought now, right, if anything's going to go wrong, they're going to tell me, don't bring anything back. The, the Dutch trips had gone successfully. Mm. Um, I had these people telling me, you know, bring your daughter. It's all part of, you know, the plan. No one's going to think that you're smuggling drugs when you've got your daughter mm. with you. I was told that everything had been arranged, that everybody had been paid off, that the Guardia in the in Venezuela had been paid off. And that that's people the Guardia's in the, uh, Venezuelan police. Is yeah, that, yeah, yeah, like the National Army. Right. Yeah. That they'd been... Um, paid off, um, that the airport staff had been paid off. You know, I was under the impression that it was just going to be plain sailing mm. um, and even more plain sailing, you know, with my daughter. And also um, because the I wonder, I kind of wonder sometimes if the, the girl, like the the other girl that was a smuggler that like used to take me in and stuff, I kind of wonder sometimes if she knew what they were going to do because she offered, she said once when I was going, you know, oh, you know, leave. Like at the last minute, she was like, oh, you know, you could leave your daughter here and I'll look after. Mm. And I was like, no, 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 because I don't really know you. I can't just leave my daughter with a stranger. Mm. My daughter's not going to know what's going on. And, you know, anyway, everybody else, has, everyone's told me that it's all part of the plan. And I think, mm, I wonder if she, if she knew. So, yeah, I mean, that sounds, that's a big cliffhanger there. So what, mm. what, what did they have planned? What happened on that trip? Well, it's rich. You know what, as well, when I was at the airport, when I was go, first of all, we missed the first flight. We were supposed to, my boss came with me, which was odd. So he came with me to Amsterdam. I flew from Amsterdam and we missed the first flight. And then we got like the next flight, I think it was like a week later, and I was sat at the airport and I had this just awful feeling come over me, which I now recognise as instinct. Mm. At the time, I, again, I did just knew nothing about. I just had this, my stomach was going and this feeling of dread and just the closer and closer it got to going, just everything just felt so wrong on every level. But again, I didn't know how to interpret that. And... I said to my boss, I said, I've got a really funny feeling about this. And he said to me, don't worry about it then. Let's, you know, don't go. Mm. Um, and I wanted to impress him. I thought I was just being, you know, chicken shit. Um, again, all kinds of stupid um, thoughts going through my head. And I just completely pushed that feeling aside when it's almost like the universe was screaming at me, you know, to not go. And I just didn't know how to interpret the, those feelings at that time. So I just ignored them and and, and got on the plane. Um, again, kind of being reassured that everything would be all right because everybody had been, you know, paid off. Okay. So then you arrive yeah. at the other side? Yeah. And when did things start to go? When did you realise something was wrong? Mm, I think... I think I should have known. I think I knew the whole time. Mm. I think, the instinct. That yeah, about. yeah. I think I knew the whole. I think I knew the whole time. And again, it was just this naive belief of invincibility yeah. that I had. Um, You're still early twenties here. Twenty-one. Twenty-one. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I was twenty-one um, because. Nothing went to plan. Nothing went as as I th was told it was going to go. There was nobody waiting for me at the airport. Mm. I was expecting for there to be someone to be waiting for me at the airport. I was expecting to be taken to my hotel. I thought whilst I was there that um, I was going to be kind of minded and taken out and chauffeur-driven, not chauffeur-driven around, but, you know, taken yeah. around and looked after, like what had happened when I'd been in Holland working for this team, you know, I'd been looked after uh, and that didn't happen. I was just like abandoned from, from the, from the get go. Mm. I was just completely kind of um, abandoned. There was nobody waiting at the airport. I was really confused. I didn't know what was going on. Um, I had to phone my boss up that was in London. He seemed 
confused that there was no one there waiting for me. Gave me instructions on what to do. Got to my uh, got to my um, hotel, and then the guy, the connection at that end, came to see me. Like the next day, I wasn't impressed with him like at all. He told me to like wait in my room for him or in my chalet, which I didn't do because it's boiling hot and I've got a you know a three year old with mm. me that wants to go out in the swimming pool and this guy's telling me to wait there and then he picked me up and really didn't treat me very well compared to what I was used to and then just abandoned me again until like the I think it was like the day before I was leaving which I wasn't expecting mm. so I didn't like him I didn't have a good feeling about him and the when I got the when I received the suitcase and it was the day before my plane it just it stank so much of glue like I could really smell mm -hmm. like they'd obviously just like glued it and I left the suitcase open like all night and I'd go out and I'd go in my come back into my chalet and just the smell of the glue would just hit me straight away mm -hmm. and I was like I'm sure this isn't supposed to. So what was the glue? What had they done with the glue? They'd um, they created a false bottom in right. the suitcase. So like um, like a hidden compartment. Right. So the suitcase was like that big. Yeah. But really it was only like that big. Sure. And then they had this like compartment underneath. So they'd like ripped it out, put the drugs in there and then just like, you know, glued it all. And that's what stank. And that's what stank was, mm. this, was this glue. Um, and the guy was just convincing me. He was like, no, it's, you know, it's fine. You know, it's in your head and... Obviously it wasn't, but I think again, because I was just, I was out of my league. I didn't know what I was doing. Um, and I think I'd set these wheels in motion and I was kind of on this roller coaster now that I felt that I couldn't get off. Yeah. And I could have done at any point. Hi, it's Connor here, one of the producers on Extraordinary Lives at Lad Bible. We're just going to take a short break from the show to talk about our sponsor, NordVPN. Now, I'm a really big fan of NordVPN and I use it loads when I travel. As much as I love getting some sun, I also want to keep up with my favourite shows from back home. And NordVPN lets you do that, and it's so quick and easy to use. To give you an idea, recently I was in Colombia, and I was able to watch the finale of Succession whilst relaxing by the pool. Pure bliss. And because of NordVPN's threat protection, I was able to do this using my hotel's free public Wi-Fi with absolute peace of mind. Extraordinary Lives listeners can get an exclusive NordVPN deal with a huge discount by going to nordvpn.com forward slash minutes. And it's risk-free with Nord's 30-day money-back guarantee. You'll also get an additional bonus month by going through nordvpn.com forward slash minutes. And this amazing deal is included on all plans, standard, plus, and complete. Again, you can get it now by going to nordvpn.com forward slash minutes. That's nordvpn.com forward slash minutes. So you get to the airport with yeah. the suitcase. Yeah. Can you still smell it while you're walking through the airport? I think I can. Yeah, right. Yeah, okay. I don't know if I really can. But it's in your head now. Yeah, but right. it's totally in my head now. And then what yeah. happened? So I put the suitcase through. I'm definitely paranoid for handing the suitcase in. Like when I've got to go and check the suitcase mm. in to the on the um, gate, I'm like 100% convinced that the woman can smell the suitcase. But now I'm just reminding myself the whole time that it's okay, like, they're all in on it. Like, it doesn't matter mm. if she can smell the suitcase or not. Because she's been paid. Because everybody, yeah, you know, she's been paid, you know, the National Guards have been paid, you know, everybody's in on it now. So it, it doesn't, this is what I'm saying to myself, you know, it doesn't matter because they've been paid off. And then I go through to departures and I'm sat down with my daughter and next to me there's a, a table with a family sat down there, there's a, a husband and wife and a couple of kids. And I see the the the, guard, the guards come in and they go up to this table and they're asking them for ID. And I just, I knew instantly that it was not them that they were looking for. I knew that it was me. I just This just everything. I was like, they're, they're looking for me. So they showed them their ID. They come over to me, asked me to show them my passport, which I did, and then they asked me to go with them. So I'm just saying to myself, this is okay, this is part of the plan, you know, kidding myself, really. Um, so you're not worried yet still? 
Yeah, I, um, I think I'm just refusing. Yeah, to, okay. yeah, yeah, I think so. Holding it at bay. Yeah, yeah, but I'm just having to. I'm just saying to myself, like, I think you would. I think anybody would until that actual <laughs> yeah. moment of no return. Sure. That you're just going to say to yourself, it's okay. You know, when you're a kid, when you're really young, and maybe you've done something wrong, and you just think that if you, like, squeeze your eyes, like, hard enough, yeah. or, you know, that when you go to sleep, you know, and you're going to wake up and you can reverse time, you know, until you actually realise that that can't happen. Mm. That's where I was at. That, you know, just like, it's not, it's going to be fine. It's going to be fine. Like that childish yeah. um, belief that, you know, everything could be all right if we just willed it mm -hmm. enough. And um, yeah, so they took me into a room and my suitcase was on the table. So I'm still trying to justify it to myself. I'm saying, right, okay, they're just checking that they've got the right suitcase. That's what they're doing. You know, I was told that the Guardian knew. I was told that they might pull me to one side. They're just checking that, you know, they've got the right suitcase and they're letting the right person through. Um, and then deep down inside, I knew that it wasn't, but I just wasn't ready to accept that then at that point. And then, yeah, so they asked me to confirm it was my suitcase. And then they opened up my suitcase and then they pulled out a knife and I'm like, yeah, I'm sure this isn't supposed to be like, I'm pretty sure this bit isn't supposed to be happening. Mm. You know, that, that that's when I'm just starting to kind of maybe potentially acknowledge that it's, things aren't going the way that they're supposed to be going. So then they put, you know, the knife into the suitcase and they bring the knife out and, and it's got the drugs on it. And I'm like, yeah, that's definitely not supposed to be happening. Um, but I still, <laughs> I, st I still kind of wouldn't refuse to accept that I was f***ed, really. Mm. Excuse my language. It's fine. Yeah. Um, I still thought that I might get on my plane. I don't know. I thought. Well, okay. they might just say, well, we're keeping this off you go. Yeah. Right. Because I was, you know, British and they'd say, well, you know, I don't do it again. Yeah. You know, they would just literally give me a slap on the wrist and tell me that, you know, I can't do that and I'm keeping the suitcase and, you know. So I'm like watching the clock, you know, still hoping that I'm going to get get my plane. And they bring in um, somebody from the airline to translate because this is all going on in Spanish. Yeah. And I don't understand a word of, of Spanish, mm. but I understand that I'm not in a very good position here and this is not how things are supposed to be going. So the woman from the airline comes in that they've used to translate um, and she pretty much tells me that um, I'm not going to be getting on my plane and that I'm going to be going to prison for 10 years. Wow. Which just tells you that then. And yeah, there. it's a straight away. Yeah. Um, and I didn't believe her. Yeah. Or I didn't want to believe her I just thought that she was trying to frighten me and it was just a little scare tactic yeah. and that I'd get on the next plane because what else were they going to do mm. with me and you've got your daughter then, I've got my daughter yeah. exactly so what else are they going to do so then they put me in contact with my with um, my consulate who tells me exactly the same thing like there's, he has zero sympathy over the phone at all and tells me quite matter of factly that this is what's going to happen. You know, you're going to get arrested, you're going to get taken to the police station, you're going to have your um, daughter taken away from you and you're going to go to prison for 10 years. Oh my God. Yeah, and I still did, and I, st and I still didn't believe them. But in, do you think it might have been shock at that point? I think so, yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I went, it was about a year before, <laughs> it was about a year wow. before I actually finally believed that... This is it now. That I actually yeah. was, I did have a, you know, a 10-year prison sentence and I was supposed to be in jail for 10 years. So was there no trial? Was it just what you... Yeah, no, there was a trial. Right. Well, I don't know, if, I don't know, there was a court proceeding. Yeah. Yeah. But it was already decided... Yeah, well, apparently I pleaded guilty. So oh, but, but you'd... Oh, I didn't have a clue what was going on. It was all in Spanish. I had like, oh, I had wow. an interpreter that couldn't speak English. It was like the most broken English. It was the worst English ever. I'd like how he got a job as 
a interpreter in a in a Venezuelan court of law. I have no idea. There must have been some backhander included in that because it was just I may as well have not had him. Um, and and then when I got sentenced, because I didn't get sentenced straight away, I was in a police station for a few months. Um, and then when I actually got sentenced, I'd, I'd been transferred to the to the prison and I'd gone back to the prison and I had all this paperwork with me. And But I knew what was going to happen. Mm. Like by that point, I, I knew that I was going to get sentenced to 10 years. So, you know, it didn't matter. They could have done the court case in Chinese. Mm. Really. Like I knew what the outcome was was going to be and was the 10 years because of the amount of drugs you'd been caught with did that automatically mean 10 years it's it, over there it's any amount is 10 oh, years wow. okay. yeah there were some english people there was two english guys in the prison that i was in um and they'd been caught with like tons of they'd been caught with a container ship full of cocaine and they got 10 years oh yeah and how much did you have five kilos well, five kilos, but it was three kilos by the time I went to court. Oh, really? Yeah, a couple of kilos went missing along the way. Oh, wow. Yeah, it's pretty bog standard, I think, over there. That's sort of an interesting... I mean, at that point, you may as well do a ton. <laughs> if you're going to get caught for five... Right. If you're going to get the same amount of time for yeah. five kilos yeah. or a it's ton it's just or... ten years. It's just a right. standard. Whether you get caught with weed, coke... Oh, wow. Like a bit on the street or you know a bit in a suitcase or a ship full of it it's just like a mandatory 10 years so what happened during this period of the of the kind of like the 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 court proceeding and all that kind of thing what happened where was your daughter so we spent the first night together mm. um in a they didn't know what to do with me really mm. because I had my daughter they were really kind of like confused on what mm. to do with me so I spent a night in a uh, Guardia station I was like handcuffed chained to like this like a water pipe um, and my daughter was with me and at that point my concern or my priority was to try and keep her calm mm. like to for her to you know not to panic or be distraught or upset and just try and did she understand vaguely what was happening not like, really no did she know something bad was happening mm, or not even no that? okay no she didn't she didn't understand what was okay. going on and she was calm because i i made i was like oh you know there was because she was in the room when they took me into the room with the suitcase mm. she was in the room and she was like asking why you know what was they were doing in the suitcase and what was that in the suitcase? And I was just lying through my teeth to her, mm. you know, to just say, oh, you know, there's some big stones in there and they shouldn't be in there and um, we're just going to go here and just mm. trying to answer her questions and to not freak her out right, and panic her. And um, she just, you know, believed everything I said, mm. of course, because I'm, I'm her mum and went along with it. So she stayed with me the first night. And then the next day I got taken to like all these different police stations. I had to have like fingerprints done. And then um, there was somewhere where the suitcase was, where they'd laid the suitcase out with all the parcels out on the on the floor. And then um, I got taken to, I think I got taken, gosh, I can't remember where I got separated from. Nikita, I can't remember if it was in a police station or, or at a court where somebody came along and said that um, I was going to be taken to a police station and that Nikita was going to be taken and, and put into a orphanage, I think it was. In, what, in Venezuela. In Venezuela, yeah. Whilst um, arrangements were made for her to um, go back to to the UK. That must have been hard. It really was. And I'm talking about it now. It might seem like with no emotion, but I've had to process... This was 20 years ago, nearly 20 years ago now. Like, well, this actual moment was over 20 years ago. Mm. And I've talked about this so many times and processed this and had to forgive myself mm. that it's not that there's no emotion. It's that... I can't beat myself up for the rest of my life because I've done that and I've gone through that and it doesn't 
change anything. Like I know what an awful thing I did and I can't turn back time and there's nothing I can do to change that. And if I chastise myself for the rest of my life, that's not healthy for me. That's not healthy for my relationship with my daughter. Mm. So she's forgiven me, um, which is the most important thing for me. Um, and I've, through a lot of work, I've forgiven myself. So I'm not emotionless about mm -hmm. it. I've just had to move on mm -hmm. from that because it took me so long before I could even speak about it without breaking down into tears mm. for feeling like such an awful person. Mm. But I can't change what I did, mm. you know? So I have to just move on from that. Okay, so she she was um, taken and then you were... What what was the point then? How long was it from the point that she was taken off you that you were then taken to a prison? Um, I got took to a police station, actually. Um, she was taken off me and I got put into like a, a, a police station, a holding, kind of a holding police station. Um... But it was mental. I'd never in a million years would imagine that it could be anything like that. The, so, the holding station? Yeah. yeah. Um, like, I thought there was a thing like human rights that existed all over the world. They do not exist in Venezuela. Okay. Um, and I think I thought that because I was British, then I had a British embassy, I just assumed that I would be exempt from, right. you know, Venezuelan conditions and that my embassy would look after me and that I had all these rights. And no, that's no? That not at all. They, oh. you know, no way. Um, so I got taken to the police station and I got put into this room it was a tiny holding cell and there must have been 20 odd women in there big scary spanish-speaking venezuelan women um it was stinky it was sweaty it was vile um it was there was like this horrible fluorescent like light in there um, I didn't understand a word that anyone was saying. It was overcrowded. It was it was horrendous. There was um, like a, a sinkhole in the in the corner of the of the room on the floor. You know, like a plug hole. Yeah. Um, and if you wanted a wee, so there was a bucket in the room. And if you wanted a wee, there was no partition or curtain or it was as open as this studio is. So if you wanted a wee, you did a wee in the bucket and then you just poured the bucket oh down goodness. the hole. If you wanted a poo, then you put a bag in the bucket and you did a poo, then you had to tie the bag up, tie it to the gate and, you know, wait for one of the police officers to, you know, take remove the bag. Wow. That could be, maybe if they felt like it, they'd do it straight away if you called them. Maybe it could be a few hours. The, yeah, it was, it was horrendous. Um, and I was in there for for, gosh, a couple of months, I think, I was in there waiting. A couple Just of in, months? Yeah. Yeah. God, no you... food, no, like I, I relied on the prisoners in giving me food. So a lot of them were locals and their family would come twice a day and bring them food. Right. So they bring breakfast and they bring, um, you know, the evening meal. My consulate came to see me, I think it was like the the day after I'd been put in there. The local consulate came to see me and he brought me some snacks, some biscuits, club social they were called, some like just some crackers and mm. some magazines. Um, and he told me that he'd given some money to the police to buy me some food and maybe if I was lucky... They would buy me some food, but they would most probably keep the money for themselves. So I think they bought me some food for a couple of days in a in a row, and then uh, they said that the you know there was no more money, and I depended on scraps from what the other prisoners had, what their families were bringing them. So what would you have done if they they hadn't given you any? Just survived off club social biscuits or. Wow. Yeah. They're not going to let you starve in there. The, the police probably would, but the actual 
other prisoners. I mean, they're going to make sure they've got their their fill first, but, but they're going to, you know, throw right. you a bone. Okay. Yeah. Wow. Okay. So a couple of months. Yeah. And I mean, it sounds like it can't get much worse, but I think it did get worse, didn't it? Yeah. Yeah. So what was the next step after that? So the next step was prison, which at first was a, a relief. Like when I was in the police station and the consul had told me as well. And again, I just, I don't know why, but I just didn't believe anything that anybody was saying. And I think it was just too much for my mind to, to comprehend. Mm -hmm. Like I'm just suddenly being thrown all these concepts and ideas of, of something that is unimaginable for a, for a British person. Yes. Yeah. You know? And especially like now on TV, you see all these programs, you know, like banged up abroad yeah. and you, but at the time, you know, 20 odd years ago, these programs weren't on TV. So you didn't get to understand or see what goes on in prisons all over the world. Well, even now, like, cause I agree with you, there's all those shows, but even now there's a slight arrogance to being brought up in this country where I'm sort of thinking, but didn't the concert say, oh, don't worry, I'm going to get you, I've mm. sorted something out, I'm going to mm. get you out. Was there nothing like that? No, they told me from the, they told me right from the beginning that I was going to get sentenced to 10 years. And, and they said there was nothing they could do about it. They were brutally, brutally honest and clear. So there's no help? No, nothing. They weren't like, we can investigate some avenues. They were just like, this is... Well, they said that there was, um, some countries had a repatriation agreement. Yeah. Um, America had a repatriation agreement and Holland had a repatriation agreement um, and but England didn't have a repatriation agreement it was something that was being negotiated but it was something that had been being negotiated for a long time that mm -hmm. wasn't showing any signs at all of any progress and then he told me that there was already a couple of um British prisoners in the prison that had already been there five years, six years. And the thing is, even though he's telling me this the whole time, I still still, still think that I'm exempt from these right. rules. Every day I'm thinking that somebody's going to come and get me out of there. And I, I think that's just how I, what I had to do to... Not... not go into that hole of this yeah. is my life now. Yeah. yeah, I think there was just so much to try and take on board that my brain was only able to kind of process like one bit at, at a time. Yeah. And it just couldn't process everything yeah. all at once. Okay. Um, and I think I was just also in this state of, of shock, you know, because of the yeah. conditions as yeah. well. I think I'm just trying to deal with that and that, the only way that I could get through that was by telling my, you know, believing mm. that tomorrow I'd get taken out of there. Because if I, at that point, thought that that was going to be it for the next 10 years, um, I couldn't have, co I don't think my brain couldn't have coped with mm. that. Hey, this is Ben Powell Jones, a host of Extraordinary Lives. And we're just going to take a quick break to talk about one of this episode's sponsors, Better Help. BetterHelp is an online therapy service that matches you to professional counsellors. I was provided with three months free therapy through BetterHelp. I've been using it for a month now and it's been brilliant. I think sometimes we get so caught up in ourselves and what we're doing on a daily basis that we don't actually spend time thinking about what we actually need and if we're happy, in fact. I've found the system really easy to use, definitely going to keep signing on afterwards. It's a personal choice, but I think sometimes we think therapy needs to be for huge events. And actually, I don't think that's the case at all. You can use it to talk through different situations that you're in in life, starting a new job, problems with relationships. And even if you're feeling fine, I've found personally that it's sometimes good to top up every now and again. If you're interested in trying it out, you can head over to www.betterhelp.com slash minutes with for a discount. That's betterhelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash minutes with. Thanks and back to the show. Okay, so let's move on to the prison then. Yeah. So San Antonio, is that? Yeah, San Antonio. Yeah. So I get there. It's a mixed prison. It's men and women. Wow. Um, it's probably about 70 women there. And about 700 men. Oh, God. All, okay. all open plan, all integrating. The There's a women's section. So at nighttime, we're separated. But the gates were opened at, I 
I don't know, eight o'clock in the morning or something, mm. and then locked at like eight o'clock at night. So between eight in the morning and eight at night, it's just all free range. It's a self-sufficient community within the perimeter of the walls, and you can do anything you want in there except leave. It's it's literally like there's shops, there's stalls, there's restaurants, there's um, drugs, there's alcohol, there's parties. Um, and as I when I got to the prison, I saw these guys on the roof, patrolling the roof, uh, and they looked rough, and they had guns, and they had no tops on, and they had ripped clothes on, ripped shorts, um, you know, toothless, you know, they just looked, they looked like crackheads, which they were, but I didn't know that at the time. And I remember looking at them and thinking, they look rough. Like I thought they were, you know, yeah. secu security, yeah. like the guards. I thought, you know, they look rough. Why aren't they, why aren't they wearing a uniform? And how can the, how can the guards, you know, look, they've had a tough shift. And um, they weren't guards. They were, they were prisoners defending like their territory, the the prison was divided up into like sections, certain men's sections because of gang warfare, like things that are going on in the streets. So they just had guns? Yeah, like all kinds of guns from, they had homemade guns that they'd made themselves from like the metal beds, choppos they were called, they were about that big. Then they had professional rifles. Um, they had a machine gun in there. Um, they had grenades. Um, they had any anything that and, they could, and that was known and, and accepted. But, yeah, well, yeah. Th there was a there was a section like one section for the men's side where they had the prisoners, the male prisoners, had constructed their own gate. Now, twice a day, the guardia would come in and they do a thing called numero, which is where they want to count everybody to check that mm. there's, you know, nobody's escaped and everybody's there. And they do it like section by section. Now, to get into this specific men's section, the internal um, vigilantes um, had to get like permission from the actual prisoners to get through like the prisoners had to open the gate for them to let them through and it was the same with the guardia the prisoners had to open the gate to let the guardia through and when they came there would always someone be shouting if it was the national guards coming in then the prisoners would shout like agua verde agua verde which is green water so anybody that was doing anything that they shouldn't be doing in plain view of the mm. of the army had time to like you know get rid of and hide their things and if it was the vigilantes then it would be agua agua azul so you knew which ones were were coming in the um, vigilantes did you say yeah what does that what um they're the what do you call what do you call it? the screws that's what you call oh, okay, them okay. yeah like vigilante yeah yeah yeah, yeah yeah they're yeah they're so you've got like the internal screws and then you've got the National Guards that are all based around outside the prison. They've got tower points. So there's always, the tower points are always manned where they're, you know, looking at what's going on. And then they've got like an office um, block outside um, and they come in, they do the numero. They're the ones that are in charge of like keeping the prisoners in line. When it kicks off, it's the uh, Guardia that will come in and, you know, try and... So it's kind of like... As long as you're not kicking off and there's not a riot, just get on with it. Yeah. And were you scared when you got in there? I mean, it sounds absolutely terrifying. Yeah. Um, no, I don't think I was. Again, I think it was just a shock thing. Did you feel under threat? No. Like, the the Venezuelan men are very protective okay. of the women. Okay. That the women are safe and sound and there's no way that any of the guys could violate any of the women okay because they every men's section has got like a gang leader and that's just completely against the rules and if you did something like that you'd get killed like right. the men would get killed for it it's, there's a there's a hierarchy and and you do what you're told there and if you don't abide for the men you know if you don't stick to those rules then there's repercussions and there's just no way that anything like and was that. this explained to you by someone like that was in there or did was it just something you came to understand i kind of, i started to just figure out there was some things that were explained to me um but i just started to the, the longer i was there 
I learned little bits more and, mm. and started to figure out like how things went. And how about like woman to woman? Like was that, did you feel fairly safe there? Or were they threatening as a group? Uh-huh. Um, it was really intimidating. Mm. It was, yeah, it was when I first went in, it was really, really intimidating. And a girl came and she'd like grab my suitcase and sort of like run off my suitcase. And it was, um, and it, but it was all kind of like a, a test really mm. and fun and games for them. But when you're coming in and you're new to this environment, it's, yeah, it's really, really scary. Mm. And I think I just kind of tried to stay away from certain groups and certain mm. people and just process and watch what was going on. And Yeah, I mean, crazy because all that and then the language barrier as well mm. must have just been such a sensory overload yeah yeah understand what's being shouted at you or said yeah Yeah. um like it was a relief when i got to the prison because i've been in this tiny room for ages with just these women with no form of stimulation or you know diversity to the day or or anything so when i got there you know it's this massive prison you know you can walk around freely there's guys there there's music going on uh, you know it's it's, it's a relief mm. to begin with to get there um and until you know guns start going off and people start dying and you know war. and did you see that yeah Okay, can you tell us a little bit about that? Yes. Um, so I think the, f- the the very first morning that I woke up, I was woken up, there was a siren that went off. It's like an air raid siren. And I thought at first that it was like a morning bell or something to, to get up. But then as the siren went off, like lots of the Venezuelan women are crying and you can hear that they're in distress and then someone explains to me one of the English girls explains to me that what the siren is it means that someone's been killed it means one of the one of the prisoners it means that something's gone on internally and that one of the prisoners is is dead and been killed by another prisoner and like all the women that are, are distressed because maybe it's their husband or you know their partner or mm. their brother or their son or whatever so I think at first I wasn't sure if I believed them or not because again it just sounds like an overwhelming concept mm. you know that this can can go on in prison um but but it does and then there was a time when it was like it was like a war that went on for a war. a war. It went on for three days, and the the guardia wouldn't even come in. So what, like a gang war? Yeah. So Bet- two between, rival sections. Yeah, between two rival sections, and the women's section was right in the middle of these rival sections. And this war, it just went on relentlessly for three days, like nonstop. So what? What was in? Fist fighting or shooting? Guns shooting. There was a grenade that went off. It blew, there was a, They threw a grenade and it blew up like this section called um, the Maxima, which is like the maximum security is where prisoners get put in where they can't stay on either side. Like they've done something wrong on that side and they've done something wrong on that side and they can't come out because people want to kill them. Right. So they're literally just locked in all the time for their own safety because they're going to get, they're going to get killed. So... A grenade had been thrown and that had been blown up and then the two sides were just all like they were on the roof shooting at each other and then the one side like right next right next to us they'd made these massive holes in the wall they were like they were the size of doorways and they were bringing like the guys that had been like shot and killed they were trying to bring them through our bit and take them to like the main kind of office bit which was right by the the female bit but all the screws had locked themselves in and the guardia wouldn't come in because you've got 700 men like killing each other so the guardia are just going to wait until they've run out of ammunition or that they've killed each other they're not going to put themselves at risk they're just going to wait until everybody runs out of so it's not like a right it's like 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 people dying non-stop mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and then the the ambulances 
wouldn't come in. It was all over the news. It was on the TV and on the news. The ambulances wouldn't come in to pick up the dead bodies because they couldn't, mm. because there was no, because there's bullets flying every, everywhere. So these bodies, and then like the infirmaria is full up with, with bodies already. So these bodies are just left like outside in this courtyard under the Venezuelan sun for oh. two, three days um, whilst this war's going on, just just decomposing, rotting under the sun. It was, yeah, it was... And so how, do, do you have any idea of how many people got killed during that period of time? Like how many did... Did you see a lot of bodies during those three days? I don't know. I mean, I think I probably saw... I don't know. I think I probably saw about six or seven mm. dead bodies mm. and then quite a few injuries where people were being carried through with, you know, kneecaps shot and God knows how many dead bodies were on the... Uh, you know, that was mm. just the one side, so I don't know how many were on the... So were you just kind of staying in your bit for three days, just like yeah. head down? Yeah, totally, just staying out of the, staying out of the way. Wow. Yeah, and then a lot of the guys were trying to like hide in our bit as well right. because it's this kind of s safe. Not as involved with the yeah. fighting. Yeah. yeah. Wow. And then when the when the Guardia finally got back in, mm. what was that like? Like, did they have to retake control by force, or was it more like walking into just chaos and everyone had given up by then? Well, the Guardia didn't come in until everyone had given up. Right. Like they'd run out of steam or run out of ammunition. Or when I have whatever drugs it was that they were taking that was given yeah. them the, the thing to keep going. But there was punishment because the Guardia want to be, they have to regain, like you yeah. said, some kind of control or some kind of um, facade that yes. they have yes. some kind of control. You know, realistically, they haven't, you know, but they have to be show that they've got some kind of power so um they got all the guys i felt so sorry for them they got all the guys and there's this massive massive courtyard and they made them all lay down like on the it was like tarmac courtyard and they made them all lay down from like in the morning from i think it was like i don't know 10 o'clock in the morning till about five, six o'clock in the evening, they just made them all lie on the courtyard underneath the sun. Wow. And all the Guardia, they had these massive, like, swords, but they were rounded edges. They weren't, you know... Um, Not stabbing or No, cutting. yeah. Like batons or yeah, something. Yeah, just, like, huge swords with these rounded edges. And um, whenever any of the guys, you know, start to try and, like, move because they were, you know, burning and the Guardia was, like, beating them with the swords and then they lined some of them up. They lined them up against the wall and made them drop their um, trousers down to their ankles and were beating them like on their ass and on the back of their legs and the back of their knees and the guys were just like dropping to the floor where they were getting beaten by the swords. I mean, it sounds unbelievably mm. horrible. Mm. Okay. You've talked so far about, constantly talked about the fact that you were able to say, I don't, this isn't real. This isn't, yeah. I don't believe this. Was there a point where you were like, this is 10 years now? Of my, yeah. How long yeah. into it was that? About a year. Right. Okay. Yeah. I think it was, um, it was about a year and it was not long after that event, I think, where I kind of realized like this, this is really happening and I've got a 10 year sentence and I can't, I can't do this. Mm. Um, and I was riddled with drug addiction again. So I was smoking, you know, I'd got. Oh, so could you get that? In? Yeah, yeah, I was, so I was smoking crack again, you know, as much as, and it was so cheap over there as well. And I'd sold all my stuff and, you know, I was just really, where's rock bottom? I don't mm. think there's any where lower that, for me, there, there was nowhere, you know, there was nowhere, look, you know, I'm I'm smoking, I've got a raging crack addiction, you know, I'm separated from my daughter, I'm in a Venezuelan prison where people are getting killed all around me, where I have to face the next 10 years of my life. Mm. Um, yeah, I took an overdose. Purposefully? Yeah. Right. Yeah, totally, just couldn't. Of? I don't know what it was, um... 
there were these tablets that would go in mind the jail. Um, and I can't remember what they were called. Um, but, but okay, but just of, of pills, like tablets, yeah, right? Yeah, right. and I just got my hands on as on as many of them as as I could, thinking that um, that that would do, and that I could just nail all of those and wow. just never wake up again. And what happened? I woke up. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I was so disappointed. Did you have to go to some sort of hospital area? No, I'd just been left. Like I hadn't. Yeah, they just left me. Were you, were you ill? Had it affected? I was unconscious. Like oh I right. Was, yeah, wow. yeah. I wasn't. I wasn't getting up for um, uh, the the roll call or the number call. And but the guardian came in and kind of you know checked and I was still breathing. And so they just left me just to it. Know. Yeah, and then I came round. Um, and I was just bitterly disappointed that I'd come round and had to deal with this still. But it was also like, it was a massive turning point for me as well because I felt like I should have died mm. and I wanted to be dead mm. and I wasn't dead. Um, so if that wasn't an option, then I was going to have to to deal with this and and find a way to to get through it um and i prayed i got on you know i was you hear this a lot don't you when people just get to this complete point of desperation mm. and there's no hope left in the world and you dig deep and you just find this um faith i think or you're just looking you're so desperate for if you haven't got faith i think you're so desperate for it anything you, you just grab. reach out for mm. for anything so um yeah i was on my hands and knees um praying like i've never prayed for anything in my whole life you know just like tears just streaming down my face just asking for some f help somehow like okay okay i've got to be here for 10 years you've got to help me out you know you've got to please you've got to give me something to help me because I can't do this and I can't get through this um, like this. I kind of made this this deal, this pact with this higher power or whoever it was that I was praying to. Mm. It's like, you know, look, get me out of here. It was and it was a, the crack addiction again was really consuming me and I really hated myself for it. Um, and I kind of felt like if I can get rid of the addiction, then maybe I can try and deal with everything else that's, that's going on, mm -hmm. but I just can't deal with it all. So help me with the addiction and I'll deal with everything else. So I put in for a transfer and got transferred out of there the, the next week. So to a better prison in Caracas on the mainland. It was a all women's prison. Okay. Um, and... I, I stuck to my side of the pact. You know, I'd made this deal. I mean, I know you can't really make deals with, but in my mind, that's, you know, I was like, well, you get me out of here <laughs> and please. And wherever I get to, I won't take the, the drugs. I know okay. that they'll be there, but, you know, it's just too easy here and I'm caught in this loop now and I need some help. So please help me get out of, out of here and, and I won't take the drugs. So I got transferred to this new place um, and... It was just a lot more manageable. I, I didn't, I stopped taking the drugs. I didn't look for the drugs at all. There was routine there. There was no men there. There was, you know, n not, there was still a little bit of violence, but, you know, nothing compared to, there was no guns and, mm. you know, people getting killed in front of you on a, on a daily basis. There was um, workshops, there was education, there was a, a way okay. to earn a bit. And there was a bit of, you know, structure. Something there. that felt more like a society. Yeah. So you'd been in the San Antonio yeah. for one year, is that Yeah. Right? And then you transferred. Yeah. And then how long was it in this new place, which was, sounds a lot better, mm -hmm. but how long was it before you started to plan a way out? Well... Everybody always plans, you know, <laughs> sure, <okay. laughs> from the moment from any prison, anywhere in the world that you're in, anybody just straight away is going to fantasize about escaping. Mm. So it didn't quite start developing there 
Um, I was only there for six months. Mm. And then I got transferred. I didn't put in for a transfer. I just got moved on from there to this other prison um, called, what was it called? San Juan de Lagunillas in a place called Merida, which was four hours away-ish mm -hmm. from the Colombian border. And it was a mixed prison again. So I was dreading going there. I thought I thought it was going to be the same as San Antonio. Um, and it wasn't the same, but horrendous things happened there still. Um, but it, it wasn't until I was there that I started seriously contemplating and thinking about how could I get out of there. And was that just because you were like, I, 10 years is too long. Like, how can I shorten that? Well, I just saw it as a viable option. Right. Like, I could I could see that it could actually be done. Like, Were, were people not, escaping not, around you? No. 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 Okay. Um, but <laughs> I could see that it could be more than a than a fantasy. Okay. Um, because people were having day releases in, in this ah, prison. Okay. You know, people that had completed a, a certain amount of their um, sentences were getting day release and they were able to go in and out every mm. day. And I got involved with the prison guard. And Romantically? Yeah. Right, okay. Yeah, we fell in love with each other. Wow. Like massively. Like I fell in love with him and he fell in love with me. He was from Venezuela? Yeah, he was Venezuelan. And could you communicate at that point? Yeah, I could speak Spanish by then. Oh, so, you, so you'd learned Spanish? Yeah. Wow. I'd been there... Hmm. But well, when I met him, I think I'd been in prison for about three years. Okay. So my Spanish was, it was good enough to hold conversations mm. and communicate and, you know, get by. Um, so, yeah, so, so we got into a relationship mm. with each other and... I got my day releases, like I got to a, a point in my sentence where I could apply, apply for them and I fought really hard for them. I paid a lot of people off to, to get them. I paid administration officers off in the prison to sign the paperwork. Um, I paid, where were you getting the money to pay? I'd had some money sent over Okay, and... Jose, the the prison guard, right. he was giving me money all the time okay. as well. Right. Um, he would give me all his wages. He was wow. He was earning more money illegitimately in the prison, like than he than his wages. His wages was just the, uh, I don't know, like pocket money compared right. to what he was actually earning, doing things for the prisoners, bringing in contraband and. Okay doing things for them outside. So he had quite a bit of money. So he funded your ability to pay off the different officials. He helped fund it. He helped yeah. fund it. Yeah, right. he helped fund it. And he knew people as well. Okay. So. Um, and just to be clear, and obviously, uh, you, you know, it's a bit of a personal question, but mm. you said you would do it, you, you'd fall in love with him. You weren't yeah. seeing him as a way of. No, no, I'd absolutely fall in right. love. Yeah, no, I wasn't. Um, I mean, when we first started talking to each other and, you know, we, we joked about, you know, helping me yeah. escape. Um, but no, we really fell in love with oh, each wow. other. Oh, okay. Yeah, head over heels. <laughs> yeah. Unlikeliest places. <laughs> I know. I know. Um, okay, so you got the day release. Yeah. And then how did that, how did the plan start to form for how you could use that? So we were close, like I said, we were quite close to the to the Colombian border. Right. And I knew that all I had to do was get out of Venezuela and I was kind of home free. You know, I wasn't, I, if I got, if I tried to run away and stay in Venezuela, then I'm, I'm in trouble. But outside of Venezuela, it's, it's outside of Venezuela and jurisdiction. Mm. Um... So I thought if I can just get to Colombia and then, so then the, f the plan had to develop from there and it was like, yeah, but then what are you going to do in Colombia? And it was like, okay, well, 
from Colombia I can get a, a plane to Europe. I thought I can't get a plane from Venezuela to Europe because I could get recognised. Mm-hmm. I could be at the airport. Like the, the Guardia, they do, they go on tour. So one moment they might be working in the prison, but then, you know, the next uh, month or something, they might be working at an airport or they could be uh, working at like, they have stops everywhere. You can't get from like one town to another you can't travel freely without going through like guardia stops Mm. so there was always this risk that i could be a get go be trying to go through a stop because you're not allowed outside your area either you have day release but i'm not allowed to leave medi there so even just getting to the colombian border Mm. means i've got to go through some of these stops yeah Mm. okay yeah still a few stops to to go through and you know, a way to try and to get there like undercover. But I couldn't go to Caracas and get a plane from Caracas because I'd get recognised instantly mm. because I had blonde hair and blue eyes mm-hmm. and, and any guardia that's worked in any of those prisons. You know, you get to know the, the guardia because they come in twice a day, mm-hmm. you know, and they get to know you by, by your name and by your look. And so I just knew that trying to get out from Venezuela was just not, it was ve- it was just high risk. Um, so I thought, okay, let's try and do it going through Colombia. Um, and I started to get into trouble in the, in the prison because I was taking the piss really by this point. Um, I was having this relationship with this prison guard. Everybody knew in the prison that we were having a relationship. Um, he'd, been transferred out of there once and transferred to go and work in another prison because our relationship had come out. And then the governor of the prison that I was in lost his job. So he got his transfer back to the to the prison that I was in again. So like all the staff knew, like some of them were on our side, some of them weren't on our side. All the prisoners knew. I had day release. I was supposed to go out during the day to work and then I was supposed to come back in the night time. Um, I wasn't going to work. I'd had paid somebody off to say that I had a job there and I didn't, I wasn't coming back at night. I was getting doctor's um, certificates to sign me off. Um, Jose was using his connections with the people inside the prison where he was friends with the governor. I was staying out for two weeks at a time. You know? wow. Yeah, going out with the governor, you know, because Jose was friends with the governor. You know, the governor would come and meet us and we'd take him out and we'd get him drunk and then we'd ask him to phone up the prison to say that I didn't have to come back for the weekend. Oh, wow. Yeah, and this went on for like quite a few months and um, people started to get annoyed with it. Right. Um, the, some of the guards, the female guards were getting fed up with it. Some of the prisoners were getting fed up with it because I was just taking the piss really and why should I be able to do it and everybody else couldn't do it. So we were like planning this escape and we like we'd planned it a little bit more further ahead um, and we suddenly got told um, that I was going to have my benefit taken off me, my day release. I oh. got a phone call and they were like, they're going to take the, the day release off me because of everything that was going on. We'd been stopped in town as well. We'd been in town um, and kind of arrested um, um, because I was with Jose in town and the Guardia had like, got us there. The, the the prison had like phoned up and said, if they're seen together, you've got to get them. And it was like, well, you guys can't be together. Um, I got took back to the prison. I tried to get out in the morning. They wouldn't let me out that day. Uh, I had to like appeal to be able to get out. So I got out, I think like the day after and it was like, we've got to go now. Like I'm not going to wow. last like a, again. You know, um, so um, we had to bring everything forward. And then the day that it was planned for, there was like a storm of biblical proportions. Um, And my escape route was blocked. Like it was all the cliffs. There had been like an avalanche and the cliffs so the bus couldn't get through because all these boulders were in the way. So I'd got off the bus and I tried to get a taxi. Oh, so you'd set off. You'd got on the bus and you'd set off. Yeah, yeah, I'd got got, out in the morning. So it was arranged that I was going to meet Jose at the the bus station. Yeah. A place called Ejido. And from Ejido is where, like, that was our last... I needed to get to Ejido. And then from Ejido, I was going to Cucuta, which is the 
Colombian side okay. of, of the border. So um, I'd arranged to meet Jose. We decided to travel separately yeah. because we were being monitored. You mm -hmm. know, they were looking for us, like traveling together. So I'd got on the bus. I'd been this avalanche, and the bus couldn't get through because of these boulders. I'd got a taxi. The taxi couldn't get through. The taxi took a different route, but then it only got so far because of, I think, the, the river had, like, burst its banks and the taxi couldn't get through. I couldn't go back. Mm, but it's not like, oh, I yeah. can't go back. I'll go back, stay the night and try again tomorrow um, because I knew if I went back, I was... That's I wasn't, it. I wasn't mm -hmm. going to be let out again for a day release. That was it. I was going to be in there for another five years. So then I got another bus going, another route, and we got to this river crossing. It's supposed to be a, a road, and the, again, the river could burst its banks, and there were Guardia everywhere. And by this point, I'm not even supposed to be in this area. Mm. Like I've I've gone out of Mary Dad, which is way out of like the the jurisdiction that on my day release I'm supposed to be confined within. So there's Guardia everywhere because of this, you know, burst river banks and you know this storm trying to like direct everybody. And um, so I'm on this bus, and I can see like the bus doesn't want to go through. There's this was a road but now it's a river but there's all these four by fours like going through and I'm watching them and I can see that there is a path that mm. the vehicles are, are taking and then like the smaller cars aren't going through and some people are being turned around and some people are being allowed to go through with the Guardia and the bus driver <laughs> he wasn't going to do it and I went up to him and just begged him so like please like look you can do it I was like look you can do it they can do it they're going that way just go behind that truck and follow the route he's taking and like my life depended on mm. it and I think the best driver must have felt like this girl's begging me this like her mm. life's depending on it and then like everybody else on the bus then started like everyone wants to get to their destination mm. maybe not as much as I do <laughs> but everybody wants to get to their destination so then everybody else on the bus is then like jeering the bus driver on so he's under like kind of like quite a lot of uh, immense peer pressure mm. from his um passengers as well and uh you know i think by this one he wants to be the hero mm -hmm. as well um and i'm trying to have this conversation with him like when there's guardia everywhere um so he does he decides that he's gonna he's gonna go so we're going through this path and the water's filling up it's coming in the bus <laughs> like the water's coming wow. up through the step in the bus i'm there trying to hide you know with my head down like this and then you know going past all these guardia everywhere you did know? you have any sort of disguise or was it just no 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 i'm it's just, just like okay my head down like this trying to hide from the guardia and um and yeah and we made it through and when we made it through to the other side like the whole bus just like burst into glorious applause you know and the best driver feels like you know he's a hero and he saved the day and you know I'm just a quivering wreck in the seat you know like sweat pouring off me and um yeah I made it to the to the bus station where I don't know how he'd done it where Jose was waiting for me okay. and uh he said that he'd been like because I was hours late mm. it was like four hours late from mm. our like rendezvous point in time um and i didn't even know if he was going to be there yeah if he had got there if he was going to wait you know what was he going to do where was he going to think i am because we'd sold our phones like we didn't have any oh, phone because right. we just wanted as much money as we could get together oh, was he going to come with you yeah he that, came with he me. Did. he did right okay he did yeah he did come with me um so we had no forms of communicating with each other because we had no idea that this massive storm was yeah. going to happen. It was simple. It was like, right, I'll leave this time, you leave that time. We'll take separate routes, meet you at the bus station at, you know, 10 o'clock in the morning. And I didn't get there till 2 o'clock in the afternoon. God, you must have been relieved to see him there. Oh, I didn't even know. Like, I got there and I was like, is he even going to be here? Yeah. Um, and when I did see him, it was just like the most amazing mm. feeling. Um, and then... He'd got there with no problems. He'd left like half an hour after me and just got straight through. Um, and he was so lovely because I remember, and like I said to him, like, I didn't know if you were going to be here. Like, how, how long would you have waited for? And he said he would have just waited forever. 
So I don't know how long he would have waited for. But yeah, so then from there, we got a taxi to Cucuta, which is the Colombian side of the border. And can you just pass through? Well, we got a taxi with these Mexicans that we, all, we just shared this taxi because um, there was different ways to get to this place from the bus station. There was, mm. you know, a bus or there was a taxi. So we met these Mexicans and decided that our best bet was to just like share a taxi with them um, and just say that we were just going to Cucuta, but you have to go through the checkpoint, the, yeah, yeah, the border, yeah. border control. Yeah. Um, but if you're a lot of times, if you're just going to Cucuta and back, because people are doing that every single day, um, the the border people um, don't stamp your passport. So did you have your passport? Yeah. How did you have it? I got it off my embassy. Okay. Yeah. Right. When I got out for my day release, ah, um, I phoned my British embassy app and I told them that I'd got day release and that I wanted to get a job, a paid job, but that to get a paid job, I needed ID mm. and that the only ID that I had was prison ID and that I didn't want to go and apply for a paid job with prison ID and could I have my passport? And I wonder if they knew mm. what probably, I'm, I'm sure they probably had a suspicion, um, but... They gave you it. They gave me it, yeah. Okay. Yeah, they gave me my passport. Okay, so you made it to the border. Yeah. And because they thought you were going in and back. Yeah. Well, I just kind of like hid, like kind of hid in the back seat of the car, like pretending to be asleep and everyone else did the talking and they were like, oh, it's just a, you know, just go in there and back and she can't speak Spanish and they were just like, oh, you know, just, just let us through. Like, I think there must have been um, a light shining down on me <laughs> with, with favour that day, you know. Um, but there was there was no other option. Yeah. Like, it had to be successful. There, there was no, in my mind, there was, failure was just not an option. Mm. There was no, for me, there was only one outcome and that outcome was going to be I was getting out of there. And I didn't even enter my mind or that it was ever going to be any other way so we got through and then we went to Bogota to get the plane to Spain because the plan was we were going to go to Spain and then we got into so much shit in Bogota because we didn't have the entry stamps on the passport uh. so when we were trying to leave Bogota immigration like hauled us up Oh. and separated us and interrogated us, wanting to know how we'd got into the country. And ironically, they thought I was smuggling drugs. <laughs> I know, right? Um, and they, like, searched all my bags. They wanted to take me to a hospital to oh, I, have okay. scans. Yeah. yeah, like they knew something was up because it was fishy. Because why would you, you know, why haven't you got these stamps on your passport? You've got this bizarre story that doesn't quite make sense. Um, so I told, we knew, I knew, we knew that there was potentially going to be some issues at the airport. So we had some money reserved by to deal with any potential problems should we come across them. Um, and we got to the airport really early in so that there would be time to mm. deal with things. So when they said, could they take me to the airport? I offered to pay for the taxi. I was like, yeah, we can go to the airport. Um, can we go now? And I'll pay for a taxi. Because I know, because I was used to how things worked in Venezuela, um, I kind of imagined that it would be similar mm. in Colombia. And in Venezuela, when you're supposed to go to court, there was supposed to be a prison van that took you from the police station to court. And a lot of the times it wasn't available because the governor had spent the money for fuel on whatever, or, you know, on, on himself. He just kept all the money. So if you wanted to go to court, a lot of the times, if you had the money to pay for a taxi instead of like the prison van taking you, you could go to court in a taxi, but the, the guards would have to come with yeah. you. So... 
I said to them in the airport, yeah, let's go to court. Um, let's go to, oh, to, the, the, to the hospital. Oh, yeah. 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 Um, I'll pay for a taxi because, you know, if I pay for a taxi, can we go now? Because if we go now, then maybe there's enough time to go to hospital, do the things. You'll see I haven't got any drugs. We can get a taxi back and there's still time for me to, to get the plane. So after a while, they said that they didn't need to go to hospital. Uh, they said that they didn't think, they weren't convinced that I had anything inside me because I was too eager to just get to, there to and, get yeah, there and okay. get back um, and they wanted to know what was going on so in the end we ca- we confessed a little bit we just said look yes there is something going on but it's not drugs and it's nothing to do with Colombia and I just want to get home how much is it, is it going to cost to sort this out you've checked me you've checked the suitcase you've done your checks to see if i'm you know there's anything going on with me in Colombia, and there's nothing Mm. the only issue is because i haven't got the stamp on the passport so how much is it going to cost for you to ignore that and let me get on the plane or put the stamp on on my passport and there were two immigration officers and we paid them 200 dollars (laughs) each and they let us get on the plane to madrid yeah Wow. I know. I thought you were going to say more than that. Mm, No. Okay, so you got to Madrid. Yeah. And Jose was still with you. Yeah. How long did you stay? Are you you still together? How long did you stay together for? No, we stayed together. All together, we stayed together for about five, five and a half years. We came to England together. Things didn't work out the way that we'd planned or Mm -hmm. how we'd expected Mm -hmm. in Spain. So we came to England. Um, I got in contact with the Foreign and Commonwealth Office to find out what my legal status mm. was going to be, which was such a bizarre um, conversation <laughs> and, and interaction with them. Because did you have to tell them the truth? Did you have to say that? I'd, yeah, they didn't even know. I'd been right. gone. I'd been gone nine months. I'd been in Spain for nine months. Um, run out of money. I hadn't got work. I was like, right. I wonder what the situation is if I go back to to England because I knew that in England I could get support, I could get money, yeah. I could get somewhere to live. So I phoned up the Foreign and Commonwealth Office and said, right, okay, what happens if I come back to England? Yeah. Am I going to have to serve the rest of my sentence in England? Um, am I going to get sent back to Venezuela? Like, what's what's the deal here? Um, And they didn't understand that I wasn't in prison in Venezuela. Venezuela hadn't told them that I had left. Um, So their first reaction was, well, you can't come back yet, Natalie. You've still got, you know, four and a half, five years left Mm. to do on your sentence and the repatriation agreement hasn't gone through. Like, what are you on about? And I said, you do know that I'm not in prison, don't you? And that I've done a reno and that I'm not in Venezuela. And they had no idea uh, so the, their first reaction was, well, where are you? Um, and I said, that's irrelevant. Don't, that doesn't matter where I am. Just tell me what's what's my legal mm. status, what's the situation. So they got in contact with Venezuela, and Venezuela said that as long as I didn't go back there for the duration of my sentence, they had no interest in me being returned there. Because it costs them money. Mm. You know, it costs them a lot of money for me to be a prisoner in their prison. I've never contributed anything to their mm-hmm. economy. And the British government does not give them anything mm-hmm. for my keep there. So I'm just a, a drain on their already limited resources. And then as far as England was concerned, you know, Venezuela hadn't requested that I go to prison there and finish off my sentence there and I hadn't committed a crime in England so again to put me in prison in England for a crime that I haven't committed which is also a massive drain on their resources um just doesn't make sense so I was free to to just go back to England so basically you were told that as long as you didn't go back to Venezuela for the next six years or whatever it was, yeah. you were free yeah. in both sides. Yeah. That must have felt pretty amazing. Yeah. Um, it was an interesting insight how laws and politics work um, in a way that most people would never, you, you wouldn't think. No. So did um, Jose come back to the UK with you? Yeah, so yeah. Jose came Jose came back with me. 
and he overstayed. He wasn't even supposed to be there at all, and he didn't have any visas or anything. We we basically blagged his way in, and we got a boat from Santander to, I think it was Plymouth or Portsmouth, I can't remember which one, and we kind of blagged, our, blagged him in through immigration, um, which he wouldn't have been allowed to do on his own. I think it was just because he was with me and mm. I was British and we were a couple and we had this you know, story ready for them. Um, and then I think like reality, like hitting real life started to, yeah. to happen then. And Jose really struggled because he couldn't work. Um, and that was a big thing for him was to be able to provide and to be able to be the, the breadwinner. And after a, a couple of years, I think it was like maybe like three years we were together in England, this really started to um, create some issues for him. You know, it was really kind of stripping away his his identity um, and we wanted to have a child and he wanted us to get married. So we went to try and get married and were told that we couldn't get married because he didn't have, he needed to have yeah. like the correct paperwork. So then we tried to get the paperwork, but he can't get the paperwork whilst in England. It has to be, you can only get that paperwork in the country that you're, that you're from. So... We agreed that he would go back to Venezuela and apply for that paperwork um, and that he'd come back with the correct paperwork and then with that paperwork he'd be able to work, we could get married and we could have this family and, you know, hopefully um, things would work out better mm. than they were at that time. Mm. Um, but he went back and he got into loads of trouble at Heathrow Airport because he'd been in England by this point for three years wow, okay. and he just had this entry stamp on his passport that and no visa um and they put this black mark on his passport to say that he wasn't allowed to enter um england or europe again for five years oh wow and he went back to venezuela and and we appealed it he went to the british embassy and and we pe appealed the the decision and um just got turned down so then he can't come back for five years i can't go back to venezuela and it just that we went our own i mean we still speak okay yeah yeah we're still we're still friends now and we still speak and have affection for each other and remember I mean it's time. an amazing story you shared so another character in your story was your daughter uh what happened there so when I whilst I was away my friend looked after her mm. the same friend oh wow that right from the very beginning um god would, that's amazing I know um and she had her own stuff going on as well in in her life um, she's a legend, definitely. She's a superhero, real life superhero. Um, so my friend looked after her. And when I came back, um, my daughter didn't recognize me. She didn't know who I, who I was. Um, and, and then I told her my name and, um, she asked me, she said, she asked me if I was her mum. So I had to rebuild that, that relationship and, I was really lucky that my daughter didn't harbour. I think she was too young, mm. really, um, to kind of understand what had been going on. And by that point, she had lived more of her life with my friend mm. than she had with me. Mm. So when you were just talking about your daughter there, about yeah. how long you were away from her, how yeah. long was it in total? Four and a half years. Four and a half years. And she was about three when she got to... She was three. Got you. And then she was, I was away from her four and a half years, yeah. Okay. So um, we had to rebuild um, the re uh, relationship and it worked really well with my friend. It was a real gradual process um, and it went really smoothly. So 
I mean, over the years, it's we've had a really quite a rocky relationship with um, you know our ups and downs, and we're just trying to work through those and process. You know, I have to, like I said earlier, I've had to deal with and try and understand, you know, what I've done, mm. the impact that that had on her, not just then, but even now, the impact that that decision that I made to go drug smuggling with her, how that still affects her to this mm. day. So we're still working through that, but, um, you know, we went out for a meal last night in Cheltenham and I stayed around her house tonight and she comes to visit me where I live in Spain and... Um, we're just doing our best to move on from that. And I'm trying my hardest now to be the best mother I can be to her. I can never make up for all those years that I was away for her, from her. I can't make up for those mistakes that I made, but I'm just trying my best now to, to do the best that I can and be the best mum that I can to her now, today and tomorrow moving forwards. You understand... And when you look back at your life, which has been very unusual, I mean, as I know there's whole elements that we didn't even get to go into and talk about today, but yeah, um, it has been a, an incredible, unique, extraordinary life. What do you think it's taught you? What have you learned? I think one of the biggest things that I've learned is to never give up, um, to to keep going and that life will never throw anything at us that we're not capable of of dealing with mm. and that maybe some of these challenges that we go through are for a reason and now I want to try and use my experiences um, to help other people and to, I think like I kind of have a message to people that's like, you know what, no matter what you're going through, like I really feel like I have been like rock bottom. Everybody has their own version of rock bottom. Um, and just all those people that are there at rock bottom, I just want to say like, don't give up, you know, and, and believe in yourself. And it doesn't matter how many times you up, like don't, think that oh I've messed up three times four times don't write yourself off just keep picking yourself up and keep going and it will all come good and then all those things that have happened one day it will just all suddenly click into place and make sense that they've happened for a reason and that you can learn lessons from them and then use those lessons to be a better person and a better version of yourself it's a great message to come out from a very difficult start um look it's been brilliant talking to you and you tell your Thanks, story ben. so thank you engagingly um thank you so much for your time thank you so they're they're all attacking and basically the guy with the walkie-talkie was the one that was telling them what to was do. orchestrating that right attack. right and it's quite hard as a sniper to keep your mind straight because you you're watching people get injured mm. you're watching people die on the battlefield mm. and you've got to keep your composure 